You are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Dr. Ellen Basick, the president and founder of the National Center on Family Homelessness. Dr. Basick, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Dr. Basick, I saw something online a little bit ago. It was actually a press release, and it was entitled 1.6 Million Children Homeless in America child homelessness increased by 38% during recession era. I want to talk about that in a bit, but before we do, for the benefit of the listeners, can you tell them who is Dr. Ellen Basick and what exactly is the National Center on Family Homelessness? I'm the president and founder of the National Center on Family Homelessness. We set it up in 1988 when family homelessness was a new and emerging social problem in the United States. At that time, only about 1% of the overall homeless population were families and kids. Now, the numbers are up at around 34% of the overall homeless population. And with the current economic recession, the numbers have really spiked. And in those days, we really believed that we could turn the problem around and make it go away. What was very sad in 1988 was seeing young babies in shelters for homeless individuals, many of whom had addictions and mental health issues. And that was what probably got me very involved in it. Okay. And I see here on the website, which is familyhomelessness.org, the staff section, I just want for the benefit of the listeners to understand a little bit more about you. As you said, you're the founder and president of the National Center on Family Homelessness, but you're also a leading clinician, researcher, and advocate on behalf of homeless children and families. You also are a board-certified psychiatrist and an associate professor of psychiatry at a little school named Harvard, Harvard Medical School. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that one. And you're a graduate of Brandeis University and Tufts yep. University School of Medicine, and you received an honorary doctorate of public service from Northeastern University. That's quite a CV, doctor. It sounds impressive, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, sometimes it doesn't feel that way when you're dealing with an issue like child homelessness. And here we are in 2010. We've worked for almost 25 years in this area. And one out of 45 kids in America are homeless every year. That's a very sad fact in a country as affluent as ours. And we've worked very hard to turn that around. And despite all our efforts, the numbers keep going up, 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 up and more and more kids are involved, and benefits are less. As you know, there's been a lot of budget cuts in states and localities, and there are fewer services available, and most importantly, there's a dramatic lack of affordable housing for families. So when families end up in the shelters, they don't get out very quickly now. It's hard to find permanent housing. It's hard to locate housing vouchers. And in fact, if you have a minimum wage job and work full time, there is nowhere in the country where you can afford a two-bedroom apartment at fair market rent. So that sort of tells you the baseline of this issue. And in many, many states, about a quarter of the households have what we call worst-case housing needs, which means that they're paying more than 50% of their income on rent, which doesn't leave a lot of disposable income for other essentials. It's generally considered that an average family should be paying about 30% for rent and utilities. And many families are paying so much more, and they're right at the edge and at risk. So at a time of economic recession, the numbers are going to really spike because more and more of these families can end up on the streets. So that's part of what we're seeing now, and the numbers have increased very dramatically. In 2007, one out of 63 children were homeless, a bad number, but certainly not as bad as the current number. And in 2007, there were 1.2 million children. Now there's 1.62 million I did get a chance to look at the report card, Dr. Basick, on your website, and I think it's 124 pages, and the majority of it is the individual states. But I did look at the definition of homelessness. The report card describes homeless children from birth to age 18 who are accompanied by one or more parents or caregivers. The categories are sharing the housing of other persons due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason, sometimes referred to as doubled up. 
living in motels, hotels, trailer parks, or camping grounds due to lack of alternative accommodations, living in emergency or transitional shelters, abandoned in hospitals, awaiting foster care placement, using a primary nighttime residence that is a public or private place not designed for or ordinarily used as a regular sleeping accommodation for human beings, living in cars, parks, public spaces, abandoned buildings, substandard housing, bus or train stations, or similar settings, and migratory children who qualify as homeless because they are living in the circumstances described above. Did you break down exactly the percentage of kids who might be living in abandoned buildings or train stations versus living with relatives? No, it's certainly a minority of the overall population, but there are a lot of children who are living in cars and in abandoned buildings. Also, this definition doesn't include unaccompanied youth who are generally young teens to early 20s, who people see wandering around, who are often referred to as homeless or throwaway or runaway youth, who are out on the streets without parents. Many of them are fleeing abusive relationships in their homes. So there's another population of children that aren't included. The estimates of that group is probably somewhere about half a million a year. So it would really push the numbers up, and they haven't been counted in this count. The definition is a complicated question and has been hotly debated by policymakers in Washington, D.C. The Housing and Urban Development Agency, HUD, that provides housing in this country has a literal definition of homelessness. The definition that you read that we use is the Department of Education definition, who is the group that is mandated by federal law to count the number of homeless kids in the schools, which is where we got the numbers for the report card. And the new legislation that has been passed by Congress called the HARF Act, which oversees a lot of the homelessness programs, uses this definition. And there's been a lot of discussion about the doubled up piece of it and whether it should be more tightly defined. And the reasons for the hot debate is the definition is obviously going to drive who gets resources. If you're defined as homeless, you qualify for certain kind of resources, and if you're not, you can't get those. And it also defines the scope of the problem. So the HUD definition is far more limited, and it would reduce these numbers. And is that the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act? Now, the McKinney-Vento Homelessness Assistance Act is part of the HEARTH Act, and it has a clause in it that refers to the education of homeless children. So it's part of the Department of Education definition that's in McKinney-Vento. And the numbers in the report card come from McKinney-Vento school liaisons who are located in all the school districts, and they're mandated by Congress to count the number of homeless kids in their school districts. And so they, on a given day, will do a count. And that's the only place, in fact, where there are national numbers about the numbers of homeless children. But the definition is the definition that includes doubled up kids by reason of economic hardship. Right. So it doesn't refer to a young adult or a child or a late teen who comes back home and moves back in with their parents. That's not doubled up. Right. Do you think that the majority of the homeless children are in that category, the doubled up category? Maybe by a small amount. There may be more in the doubled up category. One of the things that we found about many of the families who are doubled up is that because they move from place to place very frequently, they don't have the same access to services. And we also find that some of the parents have more difficult mental health and addictions problems and don't come into shelter for that reason. It's almost counterintuitive that there are subgroups in that population that have greater needs, we think, from what we understand about them. There's been less research done about that group than there has been about the sheltered population. But it's a group that we have grave concerns about. There are definitely safety issues for the children as they move from place to place and sleep in whatever bed they can on given nights. Because that group is a highly transient population. That's sad. I was kind of hoping it would be the largest category there because you hate to think about kids living in motels or camping grounds or emergency or transitional shelters. That's why I was kind of hoping for that. But it's not. And as you said, it's not a researched category. And I can understand why it isn't because besides the fact that they're so transient, why would they want to let anybody know where they're staying, right? Yes. And it's hard to find them and identify them and figure out how to create a sample that's reliable of who these people are. But we also know that before people move into shelter, that most of them have been doubled up for varying periods of time. That's the route into formal emergency shelters. 
I want to go back to what you said before. It sounded like a really startling statistic. And I just wanted to say something before I said that. I think a lot of people who might have seen this news, at least I saw it on the internet. I haven't watched TV in over 20 years, so I don't know if it was on TV. Oh. I don't know if it was disseminated widely. I hope it was. Perhaps you would know about that. It, yes, it was on CBS Nightly News. It was on NBC. There were several AP and Reuters articles. It was actually fairly widely disseminated. There was a fair amount of NPR. National Public Radio did stories, particularly in some of the southern states, that ranked lower on the composite ranking in the report card. Mm -hmm. It was very widely disseminated. It was all over the internet. It was on Huffington Post and Drudge. It was picked up widely. I think people were very startled about the 1 in 45. I mean, we're an affluent nation, and this is an emerging third world, and it's getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, startling is a good word, and a lot of folks would probably get the vision of a million kids, two million kids on the street, and it's, of course, not necessarily the case, as is indicated by the definition of homelessness, but there probably are children out on the street, I would imagine. There are children out on the street, but the other thing to consider is what is it like for a kid who doesn't have their own bed? They don't know where they're going to sleep the next night. They don't know where they're going to land. They don't know whether they're going to have a meal the next day. A lot of these kids are hungry as well. Hunger and homelessness seem to go together. It's very frightening. The usual routines that kids count on are all disrupted. Kids don't have very many possessions with them. If they forgot pets, their pets are gone. So their life is really scary and disrupted. Yeah. And in some ways, being in shelter can be possibly for some kids a drop more comforting, although shelters have their own difficulties since the way most families are sheltered is they all stay in the same room. Right. And particularly if there are babies and young kids, if a baby is up at night, the whole family's up at night. And it's very hard, particularly for school-age kids, to be able to get homework done sure. or to find a private place to read a book. It's chaotic, and it's very hard having the entire family living on top of each other. I can't imagine, and it always goes back to we really don't know how lucky we are. That's right. That's right. And, and just imagine if there's a kid who's hyperactive or a kid with medical problems in that setting. It's very, very difficult. And it's just difficult for everyone. It's difficult. And right. kids are a little tired and unable to pay attention. And then people wonder why their proficiency in math reading, which is one of the things that we looked at in the report card, is so low. And I think it's completely understandable. We talked about startling. What I thought I heard you say was that the percentage, when you first started doing this in 1988, unless I heard you wrong, it sounded like you said the percentage was 1%. If you look at all people who are homeless, about 1% were families and kids. So a teeny number. There was a trickle of homeless families in 1988. And now it's all the way up to, it's about 38% now of the overall homeless population just in this period of time without, in fact, considering the impact of the recession. Because five years ago, the number was probably about 32%. So it's about a third now of the overall homeless population. And it's been increasing steadily since the late 80s as a social problem. And that's very disturbing since this is a problem primarily of children and probably about 45%, maybe higher, maybe about half, are children who are less than six years old. Oh, so can you imagine being a baby or a toddler and growing up in these circumstances? It's pretty tough. Like I said, I can't. I really can't. Did you break it down by any categories at all? Besides the individual states, which we're going to get to, did you break it down further? Did you do race, perhaps? No, we didn't this time. The race generally reflects the ethnicity and race of the city or the locale. So in cities where there's a disproportionate number of minorities, there's going to be a disproportionate number of minority homeless people. For example, in New York City, in the city itself, or in Los Angeles, which are some of the big population centers for this problem. California, New York, Texas, Florida, Chicago, Illinois, and Arizona have the biggest absolute numbers of homeless kids. In the report card, when we looked at the numbers, we did an adjustment for this population of kids in the state. So it was done proportionally. But in absolute terms, those six states account for almost 50% of the problem. Well, what are those states again? Can you repeat them? California and Los Angeles, of course, is now viewed as the homeless capital of the United States, New York City or New York, Texas, Florida, Illinois, and Arizona. 
and they account now for 50% of that number. And California has approximately 335,000 homeless kids, and we know that that's an undercount because they changed their data collection system between 2009 and 2010, and their number dropped by about 162,000, which is impossible. So there's a data issue there, but their numbers are very large. And California in 2009 reported almost 497,000 homeless kids. It's almost half a million in one place, in one state. And as you know, California has had huge cutbacks in their budgets and cutbacks in their support of housing. So California is having just an enormous problem. But so is the rest of the country. One homeless kid is one kid too many. Absolutely. Getting back to that figure from 1% in 1988 to about 38% of the homeless population are families now. That's correct. And you're saying out of that percentage, about half of them are kids six and younger? Yes. This is an epidemic. Yes, it is. It is. And what's very shocking about it is, is that if you look at some of the historical archives, if you go back 100 years or if you go back to the 1970s even, you didn't see homeless kids on the street, homeless families in these configurations. You didn't see them. You saw them during the Great Depression or severe recessions. You always do because the numbers of homeless people increase when there's a recession. But across the century, this was not part of the landscape. And starting in the mid-'80s, there was a trickle of families, and then the numbers got bigger and bigger, and they've continued to increase despite all our efforts to stem the tide. Again, I'm looking at your website, and I'm looking at the press release. Of course, the report was called, I guess, America's Youngest Outcasts, 2010. And as you mentioned before, 1.6 million American children, or 1 in 45, are homeless in a year. This equates to more than 30,000 children each week, or more than 4,400 each day. So this figure is not static. It's actually continuing. So what you're saying is every day, every day the sun comes up, there's going to be almost 4,500 children who are becoming homeless? Who are homeless on that given day. The duration of homelessness varies very considerably, and part of it depends on your community and whether you're able to get a housing voucher and move into permanent housing, or very often what happens is families find it hard to tolerate living in shelter for any length of time, and they'll go back to doubling up or living in very transient situations. So it's very hard to stabilize when the supply of decent, affordable housing is so limited. And part of what families need to stabilize, they need housing vouchers, and they're hard to come by these days. There aren't that many available in most locales, and then families have trouble converting them because landlords have to agree. There are certain agreements and rules about the use of these vouchers because the vouchers guarantee that you'll be paying 30% of your income on rent. they are subsidies. Right. So they allow people who are very poor to be able to maintain permanent housing. And the housing stock just isn't out there. And it's very, very difficult. So a lot of these families are transient and are in highly unstable circumstances. The other very important fact is that about 85% overall are families that are headed by women alone. And this is very much part of the picture. And families headed by women alone are very poor. And they're poorer than traditional families, they're poorer than elderly people, and they're poorer than disabled people. And poverty and the lack of affordable housing is the driver for homelessness. So this pool of female-headed families becomes at great risk of becoming homeless. And part of the reason we think that there's been an explosion in family homelessness has to do with the breakdown in structure of the family, that the numbers of female-headed families have increased dramatically since the mid-'80s. And this is a pool of people who are very poor, which makes them more at risk. And so that's part of why we've seen this increase, in addition, of course, to the lack of national housing policy around affordable housing and around rehabilitation of new units and combined with gentrification of cities and condominium conversions have decreased housing stock for low-income people. And then now we've got the recession, so the unemployment rates have sort of stagnated at very high levels, and it's very hard to get a job that pays a livable wage. And if you're a mom by yourself, you need flexible hours, you need reasonable benefits, or you need childcare vouchers. Those are hard to come by as well. If you need somebody to take care of your second child who might be very young, the average homeless family has two kids. There's a lot of mythology that these families are very large. Right. They're not. The average family is two kids and a mom. 
I know we talked before about if you broke this down into certain categories and we talked about race and you did not, but overall, is there an average of which race has which percentage of homeless? There's people? a disproportionate representation among the homeless population of minorities, and there are more African Americans and more Hispanics. And the largest minority population are African Americans. And some of it correlates with the number of female headed families right. and also what the composition of the inner city looks like. Because if you move out into the suburbs, the problem is going to be primarily white because okay. the majority population is white. So it's going to reflect that. And because this is a problem more that you see in the cities. Now, one thing to also say is that we're certain that we've undercounted rural homeless people because rural homelessness looks different. And there are certain locales, if you go into the backwaters of Mississippi or of some of the Gulf cities, a lot of people who live in very substandard housing would not be considered homeless, even though they might not have plumbing or something like that. That, by definition, would qualify as worst case housing needs and would probably qualify as homeless. But it's counted differently and it's view differently in rural areas. So we don't really know what the rural issue is. We think that the number of people who are genuinely homeless in rural areas is much higher than we've ever counted. So that's another place that we're not sure because it looks different. And there aren't shelters in most rural areas. And I just wanted to make sure I heard right. You said that 85% of the total homeless are families headed by just a female? Yes, okay. that's correct. And, gotcha. and it varies by geographic locale. In the Northwest and Southwest, it's probably about 75% of the families. There are more traditional families in those areas. In mm -hmm. the Northeast, the number is probably up in the 90s, probably well above 90% are female-headed families. Although with the recession, we're seeing more dads who are out there with their kids alone and more two-parent families. And we're also seeing more families who are living in shelters and going to work from the shelter. Wow. And that's horrible. And they can't afford housing, even though they're working one and a half jobs, yeah. but they're living in shelters. This is an issue, I think, that touches on many aspects of what's happening here in this country. I just recently had the chance to interview the author of the book, Is Marriage for White People? How the African-American Marriage Decline Affects Everyone by a law professor out in California. I don't know if you heard of that book, but at any rate, the interesting thing about it is, as far as we're talking here, is that when you talk about the race, and predominantly it's single black mothers and Yes. Many people wouldn't realize why that is, and one of the main reasons that is is because of the incredibly high incarceration rate of men that they would have an interest in becoming involved with. And another factor, and this is all because I found this out from the book, and another factor is that the majority of single black women, as he says in the book, they'd rather marry a black man who's doing less well than them financially than marry out of their race. So there's a lot yeah. of reasons why these numbers are the way they are. Yeah, and there's a well-known study and book by William Julius Wilson in Chicago who talked about the decreasing pool of so-called marriageable men among African-American groups and also has to do with their level of education and their ability to get jobs because the young African-American men have much higher unemployment rates. So they're not able to get jobs that can support a family. And William Julius Wilson talks about it as a decreasing pool of marriageable men. Right. So there has been greatly increased numbers of women who are alone or divorced women who are not remarrying, and they're very poor. And you can understand what the cascading effect is, being a single parent. In order to go to work, you've got to have child care. Child care is very expensive. To have quality child care, you probably need child care vouchers. Those are very, very hard to come by. And priority is not given to homeless families at this point. There's been some advocacy to try to do that. And if you don't have extended family, and as we know, the extended families have broken down in a lot of the cities, there's nobody who's going to be able to take care of your kids so you can't go to work. Or let's say you have a kid with asthma who gets sent home. You're going to have to leave work to take care of that kid. And you leave work enough times, you're going to get fired. Yeah, of course. So there's a lot of challenges in being able to become self-sufficient if you're a low-income mom who's alone and generally not as well educated as some middle class and upper class mothers who have had a lot more opportunity. Have any studies been done about the psychological effect on children who have the misfortune of being or having been or continue to be in shelters? Yes, there have been a lot of studies. We've done some of them and the effects obviously are not good. 
a lot of these children have been exposed to what we call traumatic stress, homelessness being a traumatic stressor. And it's an experience that's sort of out of the realm of the ordinary, that's very overwhelming and that overwhelms a kid's coping capacities. There are studies that have shown that if you had enough traumatic stressors, no matter what they are, there's a certain threshold, that the long-term medical and psychological effects are lifelong and very serious. And that's called the ACE study, the Adverse Child Experience Study. And it just says that if you have enough trauma in your young life, you're going to pay for it for a long, long time. And what was very impressive about some of these studies is they showed long-term medical problems that were pretty serious that people develop as adults because of these earlier experiences. Now, in the moment that this is going on, kids are anxious and depressed. You'll see younger kids showing developmental delays. Kids who formerly had reasonable beginning language or started to walk will stop doing those things. You'll see all kinds of expressions of it. Other kids will become very withdrawn. Other kids will become hostile or antisocial and act out in school and get into all kinds of trouble. So kids really resonate and absorb the stress of these circumstances. And if their parents are especially stressed and having a lot of trouble, which understandably a lot of these mothers are going to have a lot of trouble because this is a very scary set of circumstances, the kids are going to feel that and absorb it because of their tight bond with their moms. And the other important point is that mothers who are homeless, love their kids as much as you do and I do, and have the same hopes and dreams for their children as we do. It's not any different. And their challenges are just so much greater. Are you seeing a lot more of the white population go into the homeless category over the past? I guess this study was what, from 2007 to 2010? Yes, we focused on those years. We haven't tracked the ethnicity, and part of the reason we haven't is that we use a lot of national data sets, and some of them don't record ethnicity. It's hard to do, and it's hard to do it accurately. What about based on Uh, anecdotal evidence out in the field, if there is any? Yes, anecdotal evidence is that more of the middle class is shrinking, that the bottom is getting bigger, the middle class is smaller, and as the bottom gets bigger and there are more poor people, there are greater risks for homelessness and more people are going to become homeless, particularly during a recession like now. And this recession had the added characteristic of high numbers of housing foreclosures. And what we don't know is we actually don't know the full pathway of people from a foreclosed house into homelessness. We do know that renters are at high risk if their apartment house is foreclosed because they often get no warning and their administrative expenses they have to move immediately they often don't have available cash their assets decrease and it's a scary situation because they're often not given notice if they're in an apartment house that suddenly they're evicted Hmm. through no fault of their own i'm looking at the map here and again this is a 124 page pdf file i'm looking at the map on page 13 and you have the top 10 states and the bottom 10 states, and it looks like pretty much there's a clean sweep of the South being the bottom Mm -hmm. 10 states except for Texas. I don't know how close Texas was to falling into that top 10 category. Well, Texas in our first report card, which we reported on data around numbers from 2006, which was the hurricane year, Texas ranked number 50th. They've improved. Their numbers have decreased. They're now 38th. Right. But they were 50 in 2006 in the previous report card. Now, part of the reason for this particular picture, first of all, there's a correlation between the rates of housing foreclosures in some of these bottom states. Nevada, Florida, California has some of the highest rates of housing foreclosures in the country. Right. The other feature is that the southern states are poorer. It's very simple. They have fewer resources, they have fewer benefits, and their poverty rates are higher. There are more people with worst-case housing needs, so it's understandable that these states are going to be the ones who are going to fall into the bottom. We also know that California has had extraordinary problems recently and that their numbers are huge. A number of these states were among the hurricane states who in 2006 had extraordinarily high numbers like Louisiana. Right. Louisiana was lower than they are now because of the hurricanes and the convergence of Katrina and Rita, which displaced about a million and a half people and was actually one of the biggest mass migrations in our history. Wow. So that was reflected in these numbers because there were so many homeless people. And Texas, a lot of people were out displaced to Texas, to Houston, and as we know. And so Texas had the problem of being scored right at the bottom. 
But things have re-equilibrated since then, and this is the picture. And if you notice also in the top states, there are a number of the New England states which have far more resources. We know, for example, that Minnesota, which is not a New England state, but Minnesota has a very sophisticated human resource system and has some very interesting prevention programs for homeless families. They have a very well-established homelessness prevention approach in the state that's been quite effective. And some of these states are small population states, so their challenges are less. But the general split has to do with poverty rates and some of what we call the macro level issues, the systemic issues, available housing stock, but most of all, poverty. Poverty is the major driver, poverty and lack of affordable housing. Yeah, number 50 is Alabama. Mm -hmm. And again, like you said, look at the top 10, and they seem to be in the northern part of the United States, including, as you said, the New England states. And number one was Vermont. Vermont has a fairly sophisticated human service system. What's the main thing that could be done to alleviate this problem? If you had to pick one thing, what would it be? Housing vouchers? Probably the capitalization of the National Housing Trust Fund and housing vouchers. There needs to be some kind of financial stream that's going to support more affordable housing. Housing vouchers are in some ways a band-aid. There needs to be increased stock of low-income housing. Or housing vouchers is a substitute for it, but there needs to be more housing. That's the basis of this. Now, housing is essential, but it's not sufficient. On top of that, there needs to be some kind of services and supports to help people maintain their housing. But most importantly, the bedrock of this, there needs to be additional housing. And in order to do that, we need more resources. I think it's a resource problem. And in this climate, with the recession and views about fiscal austerity and constraint, Mm -hmm. that is a hard sell. HUD, which is responsible for housing vouchers and some of these programs, is level funded at this point, despite the great increase in numbers of homeless people. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been the response that we need based on what I'm seeing, is not going to be. And in light of the fact that it doesn't look like the economy is going to be coming back anytime soon, at least within our lifetimes, I don't see how it could, since most of it was based on debt and a lot of people would say scams, like the dot-com bubble and the real estate bubble. It seems like everything's been a bubble in the United States. Yeah, it does seem that way. We lost our manufacturing edge because Mm -hmm. everything's global now, and that's a direction it went. So if the economy doesn't improve, What do you think is going to happen with the 38% figure in a couple of years? Well, I think it's going to increase. I can't imagine why it wouldn't without additional resources and the unemployment rate stagnating and the economy not recovering in any robust way. This is going to continue. And the efforts in local communities to form collaborations, partnerships, rearrange resources will only go so far. Because without additional resources, there aren't places for people to live. And that is the bedrock of this problem. So it does, from that perspective, seem gloomy. Now, with that said, there are pockets, there are places in the United States where families have been moved into permanent housing fairly rapidly. The push now is something called housing first. And what that means is that people have the right to housing. They don't have to become so-called housing ready. And if they're at risk of becoming homeless, you do various things to prevent that or move them rapidly into permanent housing where they can live and stay. With the recession and the economy and the backdrop of it, and the causes of it, it does have this gloomy aspect to it. There's part of me that thinks, though, that if people really understood the magnitude of this problem and that it affected so many kids, because by and large, homeless families are invisible. You don't see them on the streets. You don't see these kids wandering around. You see homeless individuals wandering around. That if people knew about this, they would respond. For example, CBS did a series of programs on homeless kids in Florida who were living in trailer camps. And just by virtue of that coverage, there was a community outpouring and donations that I think exceeded a million dollars. And jobs were offered to families and certain teenagers were given scholarships and all kinds of good things happened. And it happened at the local level and it happened because people saw the truth of this and they were able to respond. And I was going to ask you about that. You said previously in the interview that there was coverage by CBS. Yes. This report card came out, I think it was December 13th. Has there been follow through or has the media kind of just dropped the ball? They reported on it, then they moved to the next thing. 
Well, it's trickled down. We're getting occasional press calls each week, but in the first, I would say, week, week and a half, pretty much around the holidays, we were really bombarded. So it's the usual way things happen. There's huge interest for a very short time, and then it evaporates. It shouldn't evaporate with this because this isn't evaporating. No, it's not evaporating. It's getting worse. Now, with that said, there has been some attention to the report card around various policymakers at the national level. Whether that's going to make any difference or not, we don't know because resources are so tight. And fundamentally, this is a resource issue. It's also a political will issue. Yes, I think so. I agree with that. How is your organization funded? We're funded by individual donors. We're a nonprofit. And like... Most organizations like ours, we're struggling, which we have for a long time. This is not a popular issue, and it doesn't have an obvious constituency. Right. We also do a lot of project work, so we're also funded by foundations and by some federal money. But that's around specific project work. We design programs. We provide technical assistance to the workforce, to people who are setting up programs and who are serving these kids. And there are specific areas that we work in and that we're very focused on. We do some training for HUD, where a HUD were called technical assistance providers. I mean, we've been doing this for a really long time, and we work all over the country. We have a lot of activity in some of the southern states. And ultimately, we're very interested in changing policy, because that's what's going to have to happen to make a difference. Right. But we, like every nonprofit, is struggling during times of recession. It's a real struggle to keep these organizations afloat, because we're a nonprofit. Yeah, sure. I see that you have a donate tab on the website. We're grateful for any kind of support in any way that people would like to do that. We also have, if you'll notice online, right. we also were given a set of gorgeous black and white photographs of homeless families and their situation that come from photo shoots from around the country. And there's an opportunity to see those online and to purchase some of the photographs. Where would that be on the website? The photo exhibit is called Looking Into Light. If you go to the navigation bar, it should be on the home page. You can just press I it. I see it. It's right at the bottom, the bottom one, Looking Into yeah. Light. Yeah. That right. photo exhibit actually this year was used by HUD to begin Homelessness Awareness Month, which began on a November 1st. And it's been recently hung in the State House in Boston, and it's going to be moving to various locales across the country. And it gives people more of a bird's eye view of what this is like, of what it's like to live in a shelter, what sure. these kids look like, what the providers look like, and what the whole experience is like. Really, you're dedicating your life to this, I would imagine. Am I right in saying that? That's right. It's been my professional life entirely for about the last 25 years we've worked in this area. And it's hard going because the political will does not seem to be there to directly address this problem. People are preoccupied with other issues. The disparity in income has gotten greater and greater. The gap between the richest Americans and the poorest Americans has grown, and the bottom is much bigger than it used to be. Right. So there are more people at risk, and we're seeing that in the report card. And the one thing that people ought to realize is that the federally established poverty level for a family of three is approximately $20,000. Just think about living on that with two kids. I can't. So that's what's considered to be poor not $50,000, it's $20,000. So the bar is very low. These people are extremely poor. And this year, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. We're actually going to start sort of a legacy campaign around our 25th year. We're close to our 25th year, sadly. Yeah. Because I remember when we started, we really thought, you know, we were idealists from the old days and thought, oh, we'll work on this issue and it'll go away in five years. And that was, you know... <laughs> That was 37% ago, right? Yeah, boy, I'll tell you. you know. Here we are, and as the numbers go up, you think, oh, my God, why weren't we able to do more about this? But it's a very complicated issue. Yeah, and, it is. And I think what our organization has done that's different than any other organization, we really have been the voice of homeless kids. We've been the sole voice for a long, long time. And we've also done a lot of work on their needs and how to respond to them and how to take care of them in these circumstances and make their lives better. But it doesn't make it go away, and you want it to go away. What is your annual budget, approximately? Our annual revenue right now is about $4 million, and it fluctuates depending upon the sort of portfolio of grants we have in at a different time. But we have a fairly big stretch because we've been around for a long time, and we're the go-to around mm -hmm. sort of the knowledge base in this. And we have a lot of partnerships, and we work all over the country. 
And we're actually the only organization of its kind that represents families and kids who are homeless. Wow. And I think without us, there would be nobody talking for the children. And that's part of the reason we've done this report card, and that's part of the reason we timed it for December 13th. Did you time it because of the holidays? Well, that was one reason. And the other reason is, is that the Conference of Mayors report came out on the 15th. And as you noticed, there wasn't a lot of press about it. So we wanted to get our report out before that. It was timed carefully because of the holidays, because there's a lot of attention to homelessness during the holidays. People think that homelessness goes away in the summer. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Summer vacation. Yeah, they get people somehow or another it disappears. So our fundraising has a seasonal quality to it. That was the other thought behind this. And from a policy point of view, we were very interested in getting this report out before the mayor's report. Because mm-hmm. the mayor's report is more diffuse, and it didn't focus specifically on the families and kids that need a lot of focusing. And also, I think the public can be more sensitive to the kids than they can to the adults. Yeah. Dr. Ellen Bassick, president and founder of the National Center on Family Homelessness. I want to thank you so much for the time you took out of your day explaining all this to the listeners. Thank you so much, and thank you for your interest in the subject and for taking the time. I appreciate it.